All right, be seated in the heavenly realm. Yeah. Candace, you, uh, you were seeing some things during the worship, and the Lord was really speaking to you, so lay it on us. Well, first of all, I just want to say how good it is to be in the land of awakening. Yeah. Ooh, Alabama, we get to be here with you. Yeah, and I just love coming back. I remember the first time we came, I had a this vision of horses running, wild horses. And I asked Pastor Jason, I said, what's that all about? I see wild horses. And, and you have a mural or something on your wall? With, and I feel like this is the land of the wild horses. But uh, it's the land of, uh, of Holy Spirit power just raging through your veins. I just see him filling you with his power, and it may look like you're running wild, but you're, the wildness is the wildness of Holy Spirit because he doesn't go where other men go. Uh, he goes out there, and uh, when you follow him, it's that narrow path that they, that's talked about to eternal life where other men, uh, few there be that find it, but you're ones that are finding it, because uh, I see awakening in here. I just, my last letter, I do a monthly letter of the word for the month, and I heard you're not supposed to do that, but I do it anyway, so uh, <laughs> from one prophet, but you know, I feel the word is awakening right now, and then to be, come here after I put that letter out, I didn't even realize it, the land of awakening, I heard that's what Chuck Pierce said was going to come out of Alabama. And so the Lord right now, he's awakening eyes. He's awakening ears. He's awakening those that are in slumber. For those that uh, just are lazy, he's waking them up. I don't know. I don't think it's you here, is it? The Lord's waking you up. And he's said, awaken to righteousness and sin not. And that's a key, isn't it? To awaken to righteousness. That's part of that awakening. I feel like the shout that went up tonight, there was something in that shout. The Lord did something supernatural. And whatever it was he did in you, I want you to take that away and put that in the bank and run with it. Whether it was a new level of faith in you. Uh, I believe someone got healed during that, or maybe more than one. I heard, ask the Lord. Uh, do, I wonder if they have healing rooms here, in here. And he said, no, because they are healing rooms. They are the healing rooms. They don't need to have healing rooms. When people come into your services, if they're not being, I'm sure they are, they're being healed, even without you calling it out. People are healed. People are healed during the worship. So if you're just uh, joining this group, the Lord wants to make you one of those healers as well. And then while we were worshiping, I saw a map and you know how they have those little symbols on the map. Uh, this is a resting place. This is a park. This is whatever. And I saw your symbol, and it was the the symbol was fire. The fire symbol was your symbol. He told me this is a firehouse here. It's a firehouse. You're full of passion, and I believe this weekend that it's only going to increase. There are some fires that aren't meant to be put out. I remember, I think it was Rick Joyner that said, or Francis, I forget, Francis French, somebody said that he saw the Lord going through the church lighting matches and people trying to put it out, but they weren't, it wasn't supposed to be put out. The Lord's trying to start a fire, and sometimes it's not comfortable, but he's burning up all those things that uh, you don't need to carry anymore. He's burning it up. And he wants us to be awake to righteousness and sin not. And a lot of it is those unrighteous habits that you have. And it feels good once he burns that up or he brings conviction. Believe me, it feels better on the other side. And I think the Lord told you that he told you said, what am I to offer? And he said, I want you to jump into the fire. Jump in and whatever's left, it will be love on the other side. So the Lord is going to, he's just going to be love on the other side. So whatever it is he wants to do with you this weekend, in the glory comes the fire, the purifying fire. And when we're in the glory, we can't argue. There's no arguing in the glory. 
It's just his presence. And he just knocks off everything that doesn't look like him when we get in the glory. So I'm anxious for this message. I want him to knock off more things off of me and purify me. I know we already have, we have it all, but we don't live in it all, do we? And he wants us to live in every single bit, every single bit that he's given us. He wants us to, he wants us to burn a holy burning, and it's a holy awakening. You are called to be awakeners of awakeners. You're the first fruits of this, and you have the perfect leaders to lead you in to revival. We've, we've been in revivals. We love revivals, but it needs to go on in to reformation, and that's, that's what he's doing. I sign my letters every month. Yours for reformation. We're going to go past revival into reformation. And you're going to be those who take it through from revival on in to reformation. The Lord is giving your pastor, he's given your pastors the secrets to reformation. You're not going to stop at revival. You're going to go on all the way through to reformation and some of the keys you're going to get in the glory this weekend. So I'm going to turn it over to my husband. God bless you all. We are going to have encounter this weekend. We're going to pass through gateways of glory. Some things that perhaps you've never heard. Oh, I forgot. You know it all, right? You know it all? No? What if, what if someone comes and sings a song you've never heard before? Can you dance? Virtually everything Jesus taught was fresh. It was manna. It was bread piping hot with butter and honey dripping off of it. Ha, 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 ha. Gluten-free for those of you that, you know, you're watching the cards. I believe Jesus wants to bring something fresh to you. And, and I'm, I, if you are a part of Kingsway, if you're part of Kingsway College or part of Kingsway Church, you are blessed. You are really blessed. I love your pastors. They are an incredible team, aren't they? Would you give it up for pastors? Jason and Tina, would you give it up for them? Come on. No golf clap. And all of the team, all of the leadership of the church, seen and unseen, we thank you. Some of you are invisible leaders, but you are, you're really leading. So we thank you and bless all of you, and I'm sure that that's, that's their heart. But you are really blessed. There's re- a river of revelation flowing here, a river of reformation. There's vision and inspiration here in the house. This is not a ho-hum, boring, you know, like, uh, well, let's, can we get out of here? No, this, this is a place where the Lord is really working. This is a gateway to glory. And you are blessed. And you're blessed to be here this weekend. Do you know the Bible is a book of blessing? Amen. There is a blessing from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Isn't it interesting that that song, the blessing, is like going around the world in every language, people group, ethnicity, uh, out in the jungle tribes? They're singing it. And it's the word of God. It's that blessing out of numbers, the Aaronic priesthood releasing that blessing. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he lift up the light of his countenance upon you. May he he give glory into you. May the effervescence of power rise up inside of you. May you be blessed when you come in, when you go out. The blessing is such a part of God's heart. So my wife and I just wrote a book. And you know, this is the first place. You can't even get it on Amazon yet. You can pre-order it, but this we we brought some. It's called the blessing. This is the first place where... We're releasing this newest book, The Blessing. And it's, um, 
uniting the generations. And it's really about the God of Abraham, which is faith, Isaac, which is inheritance, and Jacob, which is transformation. He's not the God of Abraham. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that transfer of blessing is going to come to you as you read this book. So I, I hope you'll go back to the book table. By the way, thank you, Diana and, and Tiffany and team for helping us back at the book table. And they're part of our, our ministry team. And sweet Amy. Amy, what are you doing here? How did you... What, yeah, everywhere we, we go, you're, you're, you're there. You know, you're the sweetest stalker we've ever had. We really love you, Amy. You're so amazing. But I'm going to give this book to somebody the Lord told me to give it to. Pastor Jason. All right. So early morning is kind of my, my, my deal. Uh, uh, if I go to sleep tonight, please wake me up. But uh, I, I really love the early morning hours. It's, it's rare for me not to see a sunrise of beauty. Uh, that's just when I hear the Lord speak to me. So for, a, I don't know, a year or more maybe, I would get up early and the Lord would just speak to me consistently. And I wrote it down and I thought it was for me. But then I began to hear things that I knew weren't just for me. So I posted it on Facebook and, and it just kind of went wild. And then our publishers found out about it and said, let's put it into a devotional. So we have a 365-day devotional on I Hear His Whisper. And this is really important for those of you that maybe feel like you don't hear God speak to you, that this, uh, I, can, I can promise you, you will hear the voice of the Lord uh, through the pages of this uh, devotional. And I'm going to give this uh, to you right here on the end. Bless you. All right. Now, you've been up and down a few times, but since I'm going to preach for six hours, I'm going to ask for you to stand up one more time, one last time. <clears throat> Put your hand on your tummy if you can find it. <sighs> oh. Let streams of refreshing flow through you right now. Father, come and glorify us. Glorify our eyes. Glorify my ears. Glorify my spirit to be one with you. Lift the veil. Lift the veil of guilt and shame and give us face to face mouth to mouth, spirit to spirit. Bring your glory to King's Way this weekend and let it abide forevermore. receive it right now. You're going to need it for what's coming. Just receive it. Come on, if you think 2020 has been wild, wait till the end of, November, end of October comes. More, Lord. More. More. Pour through me tonight. Pour through me. Pour. 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 Let my spirit be an outlet for your glory. A dispenser. Hey. Fire, let it come. Fire, let it come. Flame divine. More. 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 
Espiritu Santo. Rahodesh. Songyongnim. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy. Holy Spirit. Holy. Holy Spirit. Hey. Glorify our hearts tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, be seated. and We're down to, what, five hours? Okay. Tonight, a veil is going to come off of you. The great unveiling is going to take place in the church of Jesus Christ. In translating the New Testament, which, by the way, I finished that in Bethlehem. I was actually where the word was made flesh. In a hotel, I was there leading, uh, co-leading a team, and, and I just felt the Holy Spirit tell me to stay back that day. So I stayed back at the hotel, and with grace from God, finished the New Testament. Even so, come Lord Jesus, you know, Maranatha, and, and pushed back from the desk and just started weeping and realizing you couldn't have orchestrated this. And then 2017, October 31st, people said, why did you release the Passion Translation on Halloween? I said, what? You have no clue what thou sayest. It was the 500-year anniversary of the, new te of the Reformation of Martin Luther. And may it be that God would spark another Reformation. With an unveiling of himself before the hearts of people. So in translating the New Testament, I made a discovery, a lot of them. But one of the things I discovered was a word that occurred 18 times in the New Testament. And you would do well to do a study of the 18 times apocalypto occurs in the New Testament. And the Greek word means unveiling. It is the last book of the Bible. It's the title of the last book of the Bible. One of the veils that's going to come off of you tonight is a veil that's kept you away from the book that carries the greatest blessing in all the Bible. Mm -hmm. That book. Because it carries the saws. It carries something special to unveil Jesus Christ because its title is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. People are shocked to discover that Antichrist, the word Antichrist, is not in the book of Revelation. It's not there. Right. Kind of like rapture, millennium, second coming, which second coming is not even in the Bible. It's amazing how we've built, uh, you know, a, uh, eschatological construct around terms, at least terms, at least give me a break with this, at least terms that are not found in the Bible. What if we come back to the biblical concept of the title of the last book of the Bible? It's not the unveiling of Antichrist. Can we kick him to the curb for just an hour and just, uh, and, and not even think about whoever, whatever that is, and let's think about Jesus Christ being unveiled. Did you know there's a salvation ready to be revealed, and that is the word apocalypto, 1 Peter 1, 5. There's a salvation waiting to be unveiled in the last kairos. There is coming a revelation of salvation that the church doesn't even have. And we think we know what salvation is. No, there is, a, there is coming the unveiling of a full salvation in the last kairos, which we're now in, that is going to startle the church, going to shock the daylights into you. That there is a salvation that we've veiled. But when the unveiling happens, it will be as though we got saved all over again. Creation itself is on tiptoe. Yeah. Expectation 
It's waiting. There's something all of the cosmos is longing for. And if you listen carefully, you can hear its groan. And some of the things you think are judgment is birth pangs and labor pangs of creation pushing down the birth canal something. And it's not the rapture. (laughs) All of creation is groaning and travailing and interceding. They're longing trees, rivers, rocks and hills, stars and galaxies. Creation itself is but a canvas upon which something is emerging. What is it somebody tell me? What is creation longing for? The unveiling of sons and daughters. The next thing on God's timetable is not a rapture nor a make-believe millennium. It is an unveiling of a bride, radiant, in doxos, infused with glory, worthy, fit for a king, a bride, a look-alike partner that, that Jesus can no longer be away from sons and daughters the next thing on God's timetable Acts 2.0 my friend it's an unveiling of a bride it's the unveiling of a people if you have ears to hear me it's the glorification of the church because what he has justified he has also Glorified. Faith in the justification of the cross, the justification of, of Christ, theological term, where we've been uh, infused with righteousness. Righteousness is not on us, it's infused in us. It's not an imputed righteousness, it's an infused righteousness. You are. Made righteous. The heavens have declared it. You cannot be more righteous than you already are in Jesus Christ. For in the Son of God, you're as righteous as He is. But those He justified, what does it say? He also, Romans 8, 29, 30, He also Glorified, that's past tense. You know, faith in justification sparked, 500 years ago, sparked a reformation. What will happen in the last days when we take the same faith, past tense, those he, he called, he justified. But that doesn't stop there. Your gospel has stopped there. God's does not. Because those he justified, he also Glorified. The earth is about to see a representation of Jesus like never before. And one of the great things that will take place is an unveiling. He will be unveiled, but so will we, for we are in him. When he is unveiled, so are we. When we see him, we'll be like him. Because we see him as he really is, not the way he was. You see, he was and is And is to come. And you've worshipped the was Jesus. Not the is. Glorified. A human being is in the Trinity. Inside the triune glory is a man. A human being. Yes, he's God eternal. But when he became an embryo. And funneled deity into humanity. When he, if I could say, you know, shrunk himself into, into human form, it was forever. He would never, ever leave that component of, of a body. And in heaven now is a human being with flesh and bone. And we are now of flesh and of his bone. We are the heavenly Eve. But when you think of Jesus, realize that he is now running the universe. That's amazing. 
all of the universe revolves around a human being. Inside the Trinity is a hint of your future. So this unveiling, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2 that, that, you know, eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, the heart of man can't even imagine the things that God has prepared for who? Who? Those that love him. But the Holy Spirit has unveiled them to us. The unveiling. Love lifts the veil. The key to revelation is intimacy. Intimacy is the key to revelation glory. So there is an unveiling that's coming to this earth. And I want to take you through the progressive steps of becoming the New Jerusalem tomorrow morning. Because the New Jerusalem is not where you're going. It's who you are. We've already become that. Hebrews 12, we've already come to the New Jerusalem. We'll save that for tomorrow. Let, let's, let's get on the on-ramp a little further before I throw you into that kind of high-speed traffic. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm, I'm captured. I'm enthralled by this. I'm hearing things that I don't hear anybody saying. I'm seeing things that if, if, if this is the deception, this is the sweetest deception I've ever had. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I love it. Being one with the three in one, are you kidding? Perichoresis, the, the, the ancient fathers taught the perichoresis. Peri is the Greek word around or surround. It's a prefix. And then caresses is where we get chorus or choir or choreography, the dance around you, God, the inner penetration of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Spirit have swirled into one, but yet they're three, but yet they're one, and then how did you get in there? <laughs> that we've been brought inside the triune glory. Those he justified, he also glorified. If faith for justification sparked a reformation, you have no clue what faith for glorification will spark on this earth. Cities will be won. Nations will be conquered. We will become a God-mingled company, 200% humans. Jesus is the firstborn of a few, firstborn of many. He brings many sons into therapy, right? <laughs> he brings many into glory. But the thing that's stopping this is a veil. 2 Corinthians 3. Go, with, go there with me, please. And let me read some of this. I'll make some comments. And we'll just see what happens. So if you have paper, you can go to 2 Corinthians 3. If you have an app on your phone, why don't you? Uh, we always like Olive Tree. We recommend that for people that want the Passion Translation. Uh, version doesn't have footnotes. Bible Gateway has our footnotes in it. And Olive Tree is really the best navigational tour, to, uh, tool if you really like having Passion Translation on your phone. But you know... The best translation is the one you live. So any one you got is good. Just believe it and walk it out. That's, that's most important. So I'm going to start in verse 7, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7. If you got it, say, I got it. Even the ministry that was characterized by chiseled letters on stone tablets came with a dazzling measure of glory. Though it produced death, the Israelites couldn't bear to gaze on the glowing face of Moses 
because of the radiant splendor shining from his countenance, a glory destined to fade away. Yet how much more radiant is this new and glorious ministry of the Spirit that shines from us? For if the former ministry of condemnation was ushered in with a measure of glory, how much more does the ministry that imparts righteousness far excel in glory? What once was glorious no longer holds any glory. Because of the increasingly greater glory, increasingly greater glory that has replaced it. The fading ministry came with a portion of glory, but now we embrace the unfading ministry of a permanent impartation of glory. So then, with this amazing hope living in us, we step out into freedom and boldness to speak the truth. We are not like Moses who used a veil, there it is, to hide the glory, to keep the Israelites from staring at him as it faded away. Their minds were closed and hardened. For even to this day, that same veil comes over their minds when they hear the words of the former covenant. The veil has not yet been lifted from them, for it is only eliminated when one is joined to the Messiah. So until now, whenever the Old Testament is being read, the same blinding comes over their hearts. But the moment one turns to the Lord with an open heart, the veil is lifted and they see. The moment one turns to the Lord, the veil is lifted. Right? Is that what it says? Who's the Lord? Not every place in the Bible where the Lord is mentioned is it Jesus. Who's the Lord in this passage? The Holy Spirit. For the Lord is, he tells us, look, you're looking at me like I'm rewriting the Bible or something. Now, verse 17, the Lord is the Holy Spirit. And it's not where the Spirit of the Lord is. That's a poor translation. Hashtag, eh, not the way it should be translated. It's not where the Spirit of the Lord is because the Spirit of the Lord is everywhere. But there's not freedom everywhere. It's where the Spirit is Lord. There is freedom. And the veil is taken off our heart. It's where the Spirit is Lord. And I'm feeling the Lordship of Holy Spirit in this house. How many churches have kept the veil over people, over the hearts? We can read the New Covenant with a veil over our eyes. And we're as good we do to the New Testament. What our Jewish friends have done to the old. If the veil is still over our eyes, we hear, but we don't hear. The Lord is about to unveil Jesus Christ. And when he is unveiled, you will be too. His unveiling is your unveiling. And the last book of the Bible holds the key. So let's think about the veil real quick. What is the veil? It's law. It's guilt. It's law keeping. It's guilt driven theology. It's try harder and you'll get there. But that's not what it says. It doesn't say his banner over me is try harder. His banner over me is someday I'll like you. No. Those he justified. He also glorified. So law-keeping, the veil, it's called the, the, the shroud that covers the earth. Isaiah 25, 7 and 8 describes it as a veil, a shroud that is over the earth. But the kingdom of God breaks off that veil. 
And it's the veil of death. Because law keeping always brings to death. Always. People ask me if I keep Shabbat and keep the feasts and do I, do I, I, look, you don't go through Judaism to come to Jesus Christ. Can we settle that? We come to Jesus Christ. We have a free access, Hebrews 10. There's a blood sprinkled, freshly slain pathway that you know, the, has cleansed our conscience. And we come boldly. We all have access by one spirit into the throne room of God. We don't go through a priest. We don't go through clergy. We don't go through a church. We don't go through a religion. We don't go through any ceremonial ritual. We come directly, spirit transported into his presence. Right? So take the veil off. The veil that separates us. Let's go on, verse 18. <clears throat> we can all draw close to him with the veil removed from our faces. And with no veil, we become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus. We are being transfigured. This is Reformation. We are being transfigured into his very image as we move from one brighter level of glory to another. If we go from glory to a greater glory, where's your Antichrist in that? It's very easy to say the Antichrist. In English and Greek, ho is the definite article, and it pretty much works the same way as the in English. Did you know there's no such thing as the Antichrist in Greek? If there is, I hope we're friends after I say this to you, but if there is the Antichrist, He's sitting in your chair. Anything that opposes the, the life of Christ being revealed through us is opposed, anti-Christos, the anointing. Christ is not his last name. You know, Bill Smith, Susie Jones, Jesus Christ, you know, Joseph and Mary Christ family. No. Christ is a title. Christos. We are Christians because we carry, like Mary, the Christ of glory. We dispense divinity because we carry a glory inside of us. The old covenant is a reflected glory, and anything that is outside in is old covenant. Modify behavior, try harder. Anything inside out is new covenant. He showed me that in a dream. Actually gave me a sermon on it. And in the dream, I took notes <laughs> on me. It was the weirdest thing. He says, I'm going to send you to Australia, and I want you to cover the land with new covenant reality. I said, Okay. You make it happen, and it did. But th this inside out is the glory we contain. We are vessels, right? We're jars of clay. We are vessels of honor, golden vessels. We are, inside of us is the golden jar of manna, the mystery bread, the greatest miracle, one of the greatest miracles, if not the greatest miracle, apart from resurrection of Jesus was feeding a million grumblers for 40 years, supernatural frosted flakes coming out of heaven. <laughs> They're great. Manna, inside is a golden jar. And Jesus said in Revelation that those that overcome, I will give you that hidden manna. The hidden manna is Christ in you. The hope of glory is not in heaven. The hope of glory is not after you die. 
the hope of glory is Christ in you, unveiled right now. This is the expectation, the hope of glory. And if we, if we will stop putting everything off to a, a future time and begin to walk and bend time, bend time, that's what the key of David is. It's not a musical note. It's bending time. He went into the future and pulled grace. He pulled grace covenant under the law. He lived, as a, he lived in a grace reality that most of us don't even fathom right now. 700 plus years before Christ was born. 800 years. How about you going 800 years in the future and pulling back into your now? The reality. That's the key of David. So the great unveiling is in front of the church. And I'm going to take you through those gateways tomorrow. If you dare. I want to give you some keys of the transfiguration of our soul through the, the motif of the New Jerusalem, which is not literal. Let, let me say it real clearly, precious friends. You are not going to a floating city in the sky. It is coming here. If you'll get where John went in the spirit, you'll see what John saw. You know what Patmos means, right? The word Patmos in Greek, my killing. You just have to go to Patmos to see it. And he saw a bride that is a city that is a bride. The old covenant was looking for a city. The new covenant, we are the city. The first thing he said to his disciples, almost, you are a city set on a hill. We are going to morph into the new Jerusalem. Just as the, our Jewish friends could not understand the wild olive branch, the, the church emerging out of the root of Judaism, to this day, they cannot understand it. And yet, when I say to believers, everything you now see is about to change. And church, as we know it, we're going to become a God-mingled company. A New Jerusalem reality. And I'll share tomorrow that the New Jerusalem was uh, the breastplate of the high priest. Was a miniature model, scale model. The dimensions of the New Jerusalem are the dimensions of the Holy of Holies. You need to walk among the stones of fire, and you'll see this. In the mountain of God, it shall be revealed. On Yahweh's mountain, a rich feast. Of choice meat and aged wine. Come to that mountain. Of transfiguration. You guys okay here in this Lutheran church? Everybody doing all right? I, I'd like to get you out of the kiddie pool if it's okay. I, mean, uh, uh, I, I personally, like, I fell in love with the high board dives. Let, let's go deep. And get out of our heads for a little bit. Jesus was crucified at the place of the skull. Until the cross pierces yours, truth cannot enter. The Aramaic word Golgotha finds its root in the word Goliath. 
Where did Goliath get hit? Place of the skull. Isn't that where the mark of your beast goes? Your thoughts? Right here? It's been there a long time, since Adam. That beast, when Paul says, I fought with beasts, bro, it wasn't lions and bears. When he fought with beasts in Ephesus, it was, it was the wild nature of men. Eight times, the Bible clearly equates the beast with a nature of man. The mark of the beast is on our thoughts and on our hands. It's not a tattoo or a microchip. You've been walking in this. And the only way to not get the mark is to take the mark of the Christ, the seal of God. Ezekiel 8 and 9. How come nobody preaches? All of the scriptures, 3 to 1, at least, maybe 4 to 1, that speak of the mark of God, the seal of God on our foreheads. And Song of Songs 8, verse 6, the seal of God over our heart. So it is the number of man. 666 is the number of humanity. Get some wisdom from above and you'll see it. But to look for a person. Well, what, what about the verse that says the man of sin standing in the temple? Yep. What if that should be translated properly as the sin of man standing in the temple? That's an abomination. So the unveiling... Man, let me just drop a couple things on you and then we'll go home and let you meditate and go to heaven and your dreams and the burning man melts your wall about two in the morning and stands at your bedside and looks at you and says, son, daughter, this is the purpose of your life. <laughs> so Revelation chapter 1, the Lord told me years ago that he, he has the key to every book in the Bible, he says he left the key under the doormat. That's what he told me. He says, yeah, I, yep, I left the key under the doormat. So I found over the years that if I look at the early verses of every book in the Bible, that they hold the key to unlock it and reveal its contents. The most important scripture in the whole book of Revelation is not, a, you know, bugs as big as Volkswagens coming out of the abyss. Actually, it doesn't even say that. If you look at it carefully, it doesn't come out of the abyss. It comes out of the smoke. The smoke screen. The locus, which is always the intimidating spirit of religion. The grasshoppers that Israel saw themselves as grasshoppers. Joel's army eats locusts. What did John the Baptist, what was his keto diet? <laughs> Locusts. Ah. He was a sign from God that Joel's army had come. The army of Joel 1 verse 4. The locust horde would be consumed by men and women that didn't get their marching orders from a church headquarters. So the locusts coming out of the smoke screen are the lies of intimidation that will sting you for five months. People try to die, but they can't. Boy, that's religion. You got to die to that, boy. You got to die some more. Where God says, not I, but Christ, I've already been crucified. I'm already dead and raised to new life. Oh, religion will sting you trying to die for five months, the number of grace. But they can't seem to die. It's amazing how we get all the teaching about being dead to self and we've got to die to these things when 
not exactly what Paul was saying when he said, I die daily. He's saying, I risk my life every day. I'm facing death every day as I preach and minister the Word of God. It's amazing the antagonism that comes when you, you bring revelation to those that never heard it. So the death that we're trying to do took place 2,000 years ago. You're going to come with me in October, and I'll show you your empty tomb where you were buried with Jesus Christ. We were co-crucified and co-buried. That's part of the gospel is we were buried with him. 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel is the, you know, the, the death, burial, and resurrection. Your death happened 2,000 years ago. Get to Patmos and you'll see it. So this unveiling of Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. This is, I'm going to make it really as simple as I can. This is the unveiling of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, and Jesus gave it to an angel. Most people don't realize there are five channels of transmission of the book of Revelation. It was so holy that it came through five filters. God gave it to Jesus, who gave it to an angel, who gave it to John, who gives it to the doulos, the love slaves. You have to be a doulos to get it. So here's my question. This is the revelation that God gave. This is the unveiling that God gave Jesus Christ. You guys with me? 9.30 at night? Still with me? Okay. This is the unveiling which God gave Jesus Christ. When did he give it? When was Jesus unveiled? You say his baptism. You're right. This is my beloved son. But what about before that? Well, folks, toddler Jesus, two-year-old Jesus, learning to walk Jesus, learning to talk, young human Jesus, who is God incarnate but didn't realize it, did not understand who he was as a toddler. He had to be unveiled. The Father gave him this revelation. Is there any incident in the life of Jesus from birth to baptism uh, in that hidden years of his upbringing? Is there any episode? Actually, there's one. There is one episode in the Gospels that gives us an insight. Why just one? Why is this episode included in the Gospels and not every Mirror all the things that Jesus did. Why, why aren't they all included? Why did, why is it only that he was at 12 in the temple? But he didn't say the temple. He said, my father's house. Are you with me? Jesus received an unveiling of who he was. Don't misunderstand me. He was God incarnate. I've risked my life for these truths more than once. So I'm not about to turn away from them now. I would give my life for this truth that Jesus is the Son of God, the only begotten, as it is in King James. But as a human, because he put skin on, the kenosis, he left something. We, this is what theologians get all been out of shape over, the kenosis. It's known as the kenosis theory or the hypostatic union of, of the merging, the amalgamation of deity and humanity. And Philippians 2 clearly says he left something there when he came here. 
he let go. And one of the things he let go of was independence. He had to be dependent upon his father. I, I may be taking you down a circular road, but I hope, I hope you'll stay with me because there's something here that Jesus had to have an unveiling, and the Father gave it to him. Now let's start over. This is the unveiling of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to give to us. The whole book of Revelation is to unveil Christ in the church. To hyper-literalize the book of Revelation will drive you crazy. For example, we do not worship a lamb. We do not worship a four-legged barnyard animal with wool. That's, that's idolatry. You know how gross that is to bow down and worship and sing songs? Oh, we worship this fluffy lamb. It is an, it's a metaphor. It is, it's a virtual reality. It's a lens through which we see the sacrificial aspect of Jesus. We see the purity, the tenderness of heart, the gentleness, the meekness, that he, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, that he followed the Father's will even to the death, that the lamb-like nature of Jesus, that's what we celebrate and we come before his presence and worship, right? So can we be in agreement that we do not worship an animal. If you're going to worship a lamb, be sure to put seven horns on him and seven eyeballs. Come on, artists. Let's see something that, that will draw the worship of people. What in the world? So it's obvious that it is a metaphor. Am I correct? So the lamb is not literal. What if the throne isn't? How come you make the throne literal? Because you're not going to put God on a chair. The heavens are my throne. Get a big chair. God doesn't sit. He's spirit. It's called terms of accommodation. He lowers, the, he, he brings it into terms that accommodate our human frailty, our human weakness, our inability to comprehend. He, he's so gentle and tender that he's given us the word of God in parabolic, picture, allegoric, metaphoric figures so that we can learn the language of eternity, which is not Hebrew, it's not Greek, and it's not English. The language of God is picture. Because a picture is worth a thousand words. So when God comes and, and speaks to us, he comes with such great revelation that he has to like embed it into these realities and these, these pictures that will help us enter into its truth. Jesus is not a door. When he says, I am the door or I am the gate, is he a literal door? No. No. He, he's, he's, he's a passageway into life. He is, he is the way into eternity. The only valid entryway of the spirit world is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. There is no other legit entry point to the spirit world. It's the only way. He is that door. So over and over, God paints pictures. So when we come to the book of Revelation... It's pictures. He's coming. He's coming. First of all, the coming of the Lord, parousia, is the Greek word most commonly used. There's about four Greek words for coming. Erkomai is another one. There's different words. But parousia is the common word used for the coming of the Lord. Now, the parousia has nothing to do with space, like Way off over there, he's coming, like the train is coming, a bus is coming, you know, from far to near. That's, there's ways to say that in Greek, but that is not the word used for the coming of the Lord. Perusia has nothing to do with distance. 
parousia is something that's there next to you and you don't know it's there. Hello. It's a veil coming off of your eyes. And you see the parousia. It's almost the becoming of the Lord. So everybody missed his first coming. The only people that got it, the only people that understood the first coming in any measure, I'm talking about when Jesus became a, a baby, the only ones that received it, received it by divine revelation. Wise men, cosmological signs. Shepherds, <laughs> a chorus of angels. Mary, Gabriel himself came. Joseph, what was it, three dreams or four? He had multiple dreams to convince him. So if, if all the Bible guys who had the Torah, the Torah memorized, if, if the Bible guys and the scribes, which are not copious, the scribes are really equivalent to scholars, and that's, that's how I've translated it because the scribes were the go-to people for theology. They were the ones, yes, they may have copied scripture, but they were the scholars of the day. And Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees. So the scribes and Pharisees weren't there. So here's my point. If everybody missed the first coming except those who receive divine revelation, how come you have the second coming figured out? How'd you get there? How'd you get that smart? What if it's nothing like? Nothing like. Yep. I'm going to write a book. I keep saying this, but I want to write a book called I Want to Be Left Behind. I Want to Be Left Behind. If you'll note in Matthew 24, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, two were in the field, one was taken away, and the other was left behind. In the days of Noah, who was swept away, and who was left behind? The righteous were left behind, and the ungodly were swept away. I want to be left behind. It's the opposite. Two will be grinding grain. One will be swept away. The other will be left behind. It says it clearly in Thessalonians. When he comes with the flaming fire of his glory and vengeance, you don't want to be on the wrong side of the glory. So the unveiling. Just about done. Three more hours, I'll be done. No. Well, I've got to save some stuff for tomorrow. But my contention is that the greatest epic plan of the ages is about to be unveiled to a startled and somewhat unbelieving church. Yes, it will bring and lead into reformation. But I've, I've learned one thing. You cannot revive America unless you revive an American. Somebody's got to get this. Maybe 144,000. But those that he justified, he will glorify. There's going to be a glorified people that walk this earth. A full sozo, salvation, unveiled in the last kairos. And everybody wants the escape clause. Everybody wants the heaven when heaven has changed before your very eyes. It's no longer a place. It's a relationship. 
Heaven, while you slept last night, moved from a place to a relationship. If you will get a new heaven and a new earth, you will see what I'm talking about. Tomorrow, I'm going to, uh, to the best of my, to the best of God's grace pouring through me, I want to lead you into the 12 gateways of glory. And it's, there's a great cost because pearls are only formed with, through pain. And the tribulation, everybody talks about the great tribulation, Right? The word is thlipsis. The Greek word means pressure. The great pressure. Have you been through any of that the last few months? What if it's through great tribulation we enter the kingdom? What if the tribulation is never in the Bible, never speaks about unbelievers going through it? But it's the believer that passes through great tribulation. Tribulation. So when is the tribulation? When you start yielding to God, <laughs> you'll find out. He'll take you down a path that gets so narrow. And if you'll look carefully about straight is the gate, narrow is the way, few there be that find it. If you'll look at the verse before that, you'll never guess what it is. Because that is the straight and narrow gate, the straight and narrow way. It's the verse before it. Shall I close in prayer? Would you like to hear what the verse before it is? <laughs> do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. For straight is that gate. Narrow is the way of love. And few there be that step into it. Lord, I pray for the spirit of revelation to immerse us tonight. I thank you for my friends, Lord, new and old. Thank you, God, for the brief time we get to share with our friends. And I ask, God, that a river of revelation would pour through this house. Lord, that there would be an unveiling of a company of men and women too hot to handle, of whom the world is not worthy, that are truly glistening ones of Daniel 12, verse 3 and 4, that will shine. The shining ones are coming. Lord, that, that uh, they, they will be overcomers, Shulamites, Joseph company, living sacrifices, 100-fold fruit-bearing branches. Lord, that they will be the mighty ones who do your bidding. And that you'll unveil a people in Alabama yeah. that will set the pace and will raise the bar, that will actually mark the epoch of time of when the unveiling began. Wow. That those you justified, past tense, you also glorified, the same faith that saves you in its fullness will glorify you. May that faith burn here in this house, that we would move from faith in God to the faith of God. And let a glorified bride, the endoxos, the radiant bride of Ephesians 5, that, that the bride must make herself ready by being glorified before you return. Let us silence creation's groan. And may we be a part of bringing back the king. In Jesus' name. Hashambarotu 
Deorombarata Barosto Brostanda da Baka Hayapushonda. May the Spirit, the living God, the seven torches burning on the sea of glass. Bring an unveiled company into Revelation 5, the throne room. We love you, Lord. Release the unveiling, Lord. Let one, two, six, twenty thousand. Step in to a faith that has no veil over our eyes. This is the unveiling which God gave Jesus to give to the love slaves. felt the Lord told me that he really wanted me to lift the veil off of you. So, uh, but I'd, I'd like it to start with breaking off of your heart. And, and please realize I'm, I'm your friend. I'm, I'm Uncle Brian, you know. <laughs> grandma Candace. I guess I better be Grandpa Brian. If, if you're Grandma Candace and I have, we just... We celebrate our 
newest grandson was born four months ago today. But, but what, I want to start by breaking off of you the, the fear and um, reticence that has kept you from the book of Revelation, that has kept you from a blessing, from an understanding. It's not the book of hiding. It's not the book of you'll never understand it. It's the book of unveiling, of a revelation streams from it. And the Holy Spirit has waited 2,000 years to unveil this book. He's waited for a people. And I'm in, standing in front of some people that I know are ready for the unveiling. But I, I want I to start with just breaking that thing. So let's, let's have total honesty in the house of God with friends all around you, six feet apart. Let's have total honesty. And if you've had a fear or a reticence or nothing but confusion or you simply avoid the book of Revelation, slip your hand up right now and I want to pray for you. It should be three-fourths probably of us. Come on, be honest. Father, I pray for my friends in Jesus' name. Lord, that you would begin to put a holy curiosity in their heart. Lord, that, that we will no longer hyper-literalize the greatest allegory in the Bible. Yeah. Just like you opened our eyes to see the Song of Songs is not erotica, and you showed us the divine journey of the Shulamite, now unveil this book and the journey that is not chronological, but it is the journey into the bride that is a city coming out of heaven. Take us into this adventure of finding out about these locusts and the seven-sealed book, which we are in your right hand. You are the word, but in the volume of the book it is written of you. We are the scroll sealed seven times in the Holy Spirit. As you break it open, you conquer more of the earth. The horsemen coming out of the throne room are four dimensions of Jesus conquering us, slaying us with love. The bowls are the hearts of men. The trumpets, the message we preach, the seven thunders that will shake the establishment. Give insight, curiosity, and we, we confess we've, hid, we've hidden ourselves from this book. We felt like it was unapproachable and no one could understand it. We break that lie. We say, teach us. Jesus, Holy Spirit, you are capable of teaching us that truth. So help us with that. In Jesus' name, amen. Now the veil, and I'm, I'm almost done. The veil is guilt-driven theology. Wow. It's you're not good enough. Yeah. It's inferiority. It's try harder. That law-based theology of the old covenant had a glory. And that's why people are still attracted to it. Because they find a measure of fading glory. But you got to do more. So you, that's the thing about this fading glory. Is you got to fast 41 days to get there. And 42. Dude, I've done it. Been there. And I'm, I'm thankful for my journey in prayer and fasting. And the things he's taught me through those dimensions. And I'm not making light of them. Honestly, I'm not. But there is a, a permanent glory that is not based on how good you are, how hard you strive. It, it's, I sum it up with the two words of the Song of Songs, let him. Yeah. The first, you know, it's actually the second verse, but the, the first statement in the Song of Songs is let him. There's no guilt, there's no duty, there's no yoke of bondage, there's no try harder, it's let him. Kiss me. Hey. Hey, 
that begins the new covenant reality. Shaba baba baba. Shishka baba luskis. So I want to just pray, you know, a prayer. I got a minute and a half before the microphone goes off. But I want to pray that that veil of, of law, because whenever you read the Old Covenant, that, law, that veil comes over your eyes. If you read the, the New Covenant with an Old Covenant heart, the veil still is over your eyes. We have to have a New Covenant reality to enter into the New Covenant glory. So in the name of Jesus... We renounce, if you'll let me pray your prayer with you, uh, you don't need to pray it, I'm praying it for you. We renounce that guilt-driven theology that has brought us nowhere but into death. And we embrace the new covenant glory that is an unveiled face that turns to the Spirit for where the Spirit is Lord there is freedom. And we embrace that reality, Lord, and we give us noses that sniff out that, that return to Sinai. For we have not come to Sinai, we have come to the new Jerusalem, to Zion, to the innumerable company of angels in festive celebration. So do a work even in our sleep tonight. Work the night shift, Holy Spirit. Let our pillow become a pillar wow. of glory. Burn up Golgotha yes. and decapitate the Goliath until we get out of our minds for God. In Jesus' name, amen. Selah. Mm. That was good. Come hungry. Leave full and happy. <laughs> Amen. Some of y'all look like you need a designated driver. Hallelujah. There's some eyes rolling back. That's a good thing. Lord, we do. We just thank you for tonight. We set a seal upon all that's been said. And we thank you that we've seated with you. You're in us, but we're seated with you. Lord, I thank you for heavenly paradigms and divine perspectives. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed. Listen, we believe that, that just there's a whole new realm, even, even of dreams that are going to begin to open up to you guys. And not just dreams, but night visions to where you'll actually come back with the tangible likeness of what you experienced. And so we'll see you guys in the morning. Doors will open at 930. We'll have worship at 10 a.m. And we'll jump into the deep end. Amen. We love you. We bless you. Have an incredible night. Don't forget Thanks to Thanks so much for taking the time to join with us for one of our online services here at Kingsway. We truly hope that you were blessed, encouraged, and empowered through this broadcast. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to our channel so you can stay updated with newly uploaded content. Or if you're watching on Facebook, you can like, comment how this video impacted you, and share with your friends so they can be encouraged as well. No matter which platform you're using, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at testimony at kingswayal.com to let us know where you're watching from and how God used this service to speak to you. Thanks again for joining us. We love you.